Hello, and welcome to Conversations, a monthly conversation with me, your host, Tom Hollingsworth, the networking nerd, on a variety of technical subjects that I find interesting or fascinating. This month, I would like to talk a little bit about data processing units. Uh, you may have heard these referred to as DPUs. You might have even heard the term SmartNIC. These are things that are starting to take over in the networking and storage industry as a way to improve performance and make lives easier. But in order to have a good conversation about this, I'm going to have to build a little background as to how we got where we are today. So let's jump right in. The first thing we want to talk about is the humble CPU, the central processing unit of a computer system. A CPU, almost everybody knows what that is. You probably think of it as the brains of your computer. And in fact, that's essentially what it is. It is the chip that executes the instructions that makes everything else in the system work. Now, the most common architecture in the world right now is the Intel x86 processor architecture. And that kind of informs where we have come from for a long time. You see, Intel x86 is something called a complex instruction set computing chip or CISC. It means that a lot of the logic and intelligence that you need to be able to operate a system is built into the chip itself. So these chips are really good at doing complex things in a general way. So there are not many things that you can throw at an Intel chip that it won't be able to work on. Now, of course, because it's really good at doing a lot of things, it means that it's not very good at doing really specific things very quickly. And Intel has known about that for many years, going all the way back to the first revisions of their chips in the consumer space. One of the things that their early chips were really bad at was doing math, specifically floating point operations. Uh, that would be you know, your decimal addition, subtraction, multiplication, things like that. And so Intel decided that it needed to augment their CPUs with something that allowed them to do floating point math faster. And that's where we came up with the idea of a coprocessor. In essence, a coprocessor is merely a chip that sits beside another chip and does something. So for example, in the original Intel architecture, the main CPU was doing things like controlling IO and controlling hardware operations. And when it came time to do a floating point operation, the main CPU would send that operation to the coprocessor. The coprocessor would do the math much faster than the main CPU and return the result. Sounds cool, right? Well, along the way, Intel integrated all of the coprocessor functions into the main chip, so it kind of went away. So we don't have coprocessors today, right? Well, wrong. We do have coprocessors, as a matter of fact. And if you are someone who enjoys playing video games, you know this all too well, because the next big phase of offloading processing happened in graphics. So for those of you who know what a graphics processing unit or a GPU is, it is merely a card that you install in your system that is optimized to do the kinds of math and control functions that a graphics heavy workload would need. Um, if you are playing games like Crisis at full resolution, you know that your graphics card is probably the biggest impact on doing that because it has dedicated processing units to do all the math necessary to draw textures and shaders and ray tracing. However, Companies like NVIDIA figured out a long time ago that the cores in a graphics processing unit could be used essentially to offload other applications from the CPU. And that's why we started seeing things like tensor cores that were capable of doing AI and machine learning workloads or you know, just doing some uh, basic CPU offload. Okay, that makes sense. We can build purpose-built chips to do certain things. Well, in networking, we've been doing this for a very long time because we can build things called application-specific integrated circuits, or ASICs. ASICs are what allow high-speed network switching because they are purpose-built circuit chips that do one thing really fast. So they are, in essence, the opposite of the traditional Intel x86 architecture. Now, the problem with an ASIC is, in order to do one thing really fast, you can only do one thing. So when you build an ASIC for a very specific and application specific task, it will only ever do that. So for example, in a switch, we can forward packets at layer two very fast. But if we need to do a layer three lookup, for example, if the packet needs to move from this switch to a different network, that's a problem because now we are relying on the main system CPU to do that. And those of you out there know that main system CPUs use multitasking in order to do multiple things at once. 
Uh, it's like when you are a parent and your kids are asking you to do five different things at once. You can do all five things, but you have to focus on each one at a time. No, you can't pet your dog. I need you to put that stick down, those kinds of things. CPUs are really, really good at that. But the problem is, is that the more tasks that they have to do, the more difficult it is for them to multitask. And that's why we use things like ASICs and networking, because they can handle those tasks quite quickly. In essence, an ASIC is a coprocessor. Now, what about the sweet spot? Because you have Intel x86, which is generally good at doing a lot of things, but not very fast, relatively speaking. And things like ASICs, which are really good at doing one thing super fast, but you need to build an ASIC for everything you want to do. What if there was a sweet spot in the middle that allowed me to have a semi-programmable chip that could do a few things really fast, and I could change what those things were depending on what I needed to do with it? Well, we have that as well. It's called a field programmable gate array, or an FPGA. Now, FPGAs have been in use for a long time for some very specific tasks, especially in networking. They are things that can be reprogrammed not necessarily on the fly, but they can be reprogrammed more quickly than an ASIC and less quickly than a CPU to do uh, some variety of tasks. FPGAs are starting to gain a little bit in popularity because of this limited reprogrammability. All right. Another term you're going to need to hear about is a system on a chip or an SOC. This is kind of how people build things like mobile phones. They put all of the components that the system needs to operate on the chip. So that would be the CPU, the memory controller, uh, any level of caches, those kinds of things. It's all one compact unit that you can work with. We'll come back to why SOCs are important in just a minute. All right. So we know about CPUs, coprocessors, GPUs, ASICs, FPGAs, and SOCs. You are now a chip wizard. Let's talk about why that's important to the smart NIC market. So remember how I talked about building specific chips to do specific tasks to offload things from the CPU. That's essentially what a smart NIC does. We are building an add-in card, not unlike a graphics processing unit, but instead of you know drawing a werewolf in a video game, it is offloading the processing of packets. It is taking those packets and forwarding them out an IO lane. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means the packets still move back and forth the way that they're supposed to, but the CPU doesn't need to get interrupted in order to be able to send one of those. And that's important on a server when you consider the amount of I.O. that's going on. In the old days, when a server had one operating system loaded on it and had you know, three or four applications, the amount of I.O. that was going on was actually fairly low, which means the CPU could do other things. And unless you ran into a problem where you had a gigantic flow that you had to deal with, it worked fairly well. And then the advent of virtualization came along. And now servers are being used at a very high capacity because they are running multiple virtualized operating systems. And the IO between all of those is taking more and more of the CPU time. The other problem that we run into is server architecture is not gaining CPU efficiency. There was a time back in years ago when we were trying to add multiple CPUs to a system. Uh, you probably remember things like four socket, and eight socket servers. If you do, you're pretty old because in the early 2000s, we started moving away from that model. In fact, uh, Windows Server 2003, I believe, was the last operating system I remember working on that had support for more than four CPUs in a system. Why? Well, it turns out that in order to use four or more CPUs effectively, you have to do something called symmetric multiprocessing, which is very complicated at a software level in order to be able to make all of those instruction sets work the way that they should. Companies like Intel and AMD decided instead of making more CPUs, why don't I put more cores per chip, which means I have effectively increased the processing power, but not increased the number of mechanical pieces that I had to put in the system. This also came along around the same time that software manufacturers decided they wanted to start charging you for the number of CPUs in your system as opposed to the number of processing units or something like that. And so more cores per socket means fewer licenses because there are only two sockets or at most four sockets per system. But you're still getting a massive number of cores. Companies like AMD are uh, you know, upwards of, of 32, 64, and I'm sure at soon 128 cores per system. Those cores can be dedicated to doing things almost like a coprocessor, but you still have to get the IO to the CPU to be processed and to be sent on. And there are only a certain number of lanes that can be used to send data into a CPU. 
So if that data, whether it's IO or some other kind of instruction, never has to even touch the CPU and can instead be sent to a coprocessing unit, that saves bandwidth as well, getting more cars off the road, essentially. All right, smart NICs are not new. Um, you know, we, we, we see the term being thrown about a lot here, but in fact, the CP or the smart NIC market uh, actually came about around 2006. The company called Bigfoot Systems unveiled a PCI add-in card that they named the Killer NIC, which ran a specialized Linux kernel on a free scale processor at around 400 megahertz. Uh, they referred to it as a network processing unit back in the day, but essentially what it is, is it was a chip on a card dedicated to doing network transmission. Sounds like a smart NIC. Well, we've come a long way since then, and that's because of ARM technology. So remember how I talked about Intel x86 was a complex instruction set chip? Well, ARM is the opposite. It is a reduced instruction set chip or a risk architecture. And as we all learned in the 1995 movie Hackers, risk architecture will change everything. And in fact, it actually did. Because ARM is saying, rather than having one big complicated CPU that does a lot of things Generally, we're going to build smaller CPUs with a reduced instruction set, and we're going to use those to do certain other things. Uh, risk architecture is something you use in your mobile phone every day because Apple's SOCs and ARM-based processors are all risk instruction sets. So we have a smart NIC that has a chip on it that offloads I.O. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Well, where does a DPU come into play? All right, well, I want you to think about something here. Network I.O. is essentially sending a packet out of a system to go somewhere. It's sending to a destination. It could be a, a router on the internet. It could be a device somewhere on your network. What does storage traffic look like? We're assuming for the moment we're not actually writing something directly to a hard drive on a system that we're writing it to a, a network attached storage or a storage area network device. Well, to the system, it looks like I.O. because that's effectively what you're doing is you're sending a packet to a remote system somewhere. You may not be using the TCP IP protocol, but you are sending it somewhere. Well, in that case, why can't I just use a smart NIC to do that? That's a good question. And the answer is there's no good reason why you shouldn't be able to. And that's where we're starting to see the explosion of the rebranding of traditional smart NICs as data processing units because they're not just sending I.O. to the network they're sending storage traffic as well. So what happens when you have storage and networking traffic being offloaded from the main system CPU and being sent through a dedicated daughter card with a coprocessor to send it on? Well, it means your CPU doesn't do a whole lot of work. Well, that's not true. It does a lot less work. And it means that the daughter card is allowing your system to be utilized at a higher resource rate. All right, so let's talk about that for a minute because you probably have heard the term disaggregation in the data center. This is a perfectly good example of this. A few years ago, Hewlett Packard Enterprise coined the term composable infrastructure. The idea was, is that you could take bits and pieces of a lot of servers and build them together into resource pools. Right now with virtualization technology, a server is a discrete unit. So it has CPUs and memory, and depending on whether or not you're using it in this configuration, it could have storage as well. If I want to add more CPUs, I have to add a new server because there's no other package that they come in. If I want to add more memory to the pool, I have to add it in that package. Well, and this is kind of the way that hyper-convergent infrastructure works as well. Want more storage? You add another server. Guess what? You get more CPU and memory along the same time. Composable infrastructure says I should be able to add a, like a sled of CPUs to increase the processing power of my system. And then I can put those in a pool and essentially rent CPUs as I need them. Okay, that makes a whole lot of sense. Those CPUs do not necessarily need to be central processing units, CPU being a generic term that they use in composable infrastructure. I could, for example, add a sled of graphics processing units and I could use those in a farm to process things. And in fact, a lot of companies that are doing uh, AI workloads in the cloud and other places are essentially doing that. We're gonna put in a rack server that's loaded to the gills with tensor cores and then you want to do a workload you select those as a resource pool and you start doing things with it all right so that makes sense the question that i have for you is i want you to think about the things that your cpu are doing right now most of the time anymore they are you know processing sending email back and forth um, possibly running one of a multitude of video calls that you might be on today 
But what if I gave you a breakdown of your CPU and I told you that it spent 25% of its time doing IO requests, whether it's writing things to a drive or sending network traffic? You'd probably say that's pretty fair. I, I don't seem to mind that very much. That's great when it's a CPU that you have in your computer at your house. What if I'm paying for that CPU per hour in a cloud instance? What if I'm trying to get the maximum amount of performance that I can for the least amount of cost? Because in the cloud, if I want a high performance CPU, I'm gonna pay a high performance cost for it. And if I find out that my high performance CPU is spending a quarter of its time doing nothing but IO, I'm gonna be a little upset. And if I find out that if it wasn't for that IO overhead, that I could have stepped down to a more inexpensive tier processor and still accomplish the same workload and paid my favorite cloud provider a few hundred dollars less this month, I'm going to be really upset. And so that's one of the things that we're starting to see a lot of people in this cloud era doing is they're auditing not just their usage patterns, but the efficiency of those usage patterns. And that's why GPUs and DPUs are becoming so important. If I have a dedicated offload system, I don't have to pay as much for that CPU resource pool, right? If I'm a cloud provider, I can create offload systems that are just cheaper than moving up to the next tier. And then I get to add that value onto my customers so that they can use the system, feel that it's running more efficiently, save a little bit on the CPU, but still pay me for these offload cards. It also allows you to do more complicated things in your setups. Now, one of the companies who's really starting to do a lot with this is a company called Pensando. And now if you are a fan of Tech Field Day, you've probably seen Pensando present several times. As a matter of fact, we're gonna link to the Pensando page up here in the video with an iCard. The interesting thing about Pensando is they are taking this approach of building a DPU with FPGAs that's fully programmable for storage and networking. And knowing the pedigree of the people who are behind this, uh, they are former Cisco employees, uh, Mario Mazzola, Prim Jane, Luca Caffiero, and Sony Giandani. They've done a lot of work in this market of offloading tasks from the main CPU. Uh, they, they are very, very good at it. And they've come up with a interesting solution that leverages the P4 programming language to allow people to write programmatic ways to offload IO. And it's funny because this group coming from Cisco, you would first think that they would write a networking offload engine. And in fact, they didn't. They have been writing storage offload engines for NetApp and HPE. And it's very fascinating to, to hear a little bit more about that. And I'm gonna link in the show notes to a great post from uh, one of our delegates about the, uh, the Pensando approach to doing IO offload. Now, do you need one at home? Do you need to go out and buy a DPU for your home computer? No, you really don't. These are enterprise class hardware pieces that really work in the enterprise to do specific things. Uh, think about it like this. If you think that you need a DPU, you probably don't. If you know that you need a DPU to do a very specific thing, you should probably be looking at getting those. If you're running a cloud instance, you're probably going to get DPUs available as a, an, an offering fairly soon. And there's a reason behind that. If you look at the moves that are being made in the chip manufacturer market, there are a lot of companies that are starting to invest in FPGAs and SOCs in order to do this. Now, NVIDIA has been leading the market with DPUs so far because they have a lot of experience building offload cards thanks to their GPUs. Um, Intel is getting heavily into this. As a matter of fact, Intel is working closely with VMware and uh, Pensando on something called Project Monterey, which was announced at VMworld 2020. The other company that's interesting about this is AMD. Now, AMD bought ATI, which is a graphics card manufacturer, so they do have GPU experience, and they recently purchased Xilinx, which is a company that makes FPGAs and SOCs. I would not be shocked to see an AMD offload card or DPU coming out very soon, because this is where the market wants to go. We went from having disaggregated architecture in a mainframe where I drop an instruction set into a lane and I don't worry about it anymore, to pulling it all back to a centralized heavyweight processor that needs to do everything because it was cheaper to manufacture. And now that we're seeing the limitations of that, thanks to things like Moore's Law, we need to break that apart and we need to have more purpose-built systems out there 
working on this, you know, whether it's graphics or uh, IO or something like that. So I expect that we're going to see this trend continuing to grow for the next few years, I'd say three to five easily. And then either we will have a revolution in the way that we do processors, which will allow us to build bigger, better, faster, that are less wasteful when it comes to heat and um, more capable when it comes to instruction sets and can approach the speed of things like FPGAs. Or the disaggregated approach will take over and soon the central CPU will effectively be playing traffic cop between all of the coprocessor offload cards and won't have much to do other than just kind of sit there and be a management utility. We'll have to see how the market decides how to make this work. That should just about do it for this episode of Conversations. I want to thank you for tuning in for this discussion around data processing units. If you'd like to watch more episodes of Conversations, please make sure you check out our website at gestaltit.com. We have a category for all of the episodes that have been recorded so far. And we also have some more great content that you're not going to want to miss, including Checksum, our on-premise IT roundtable, and a lot of great posts, both from our writers and from the community that Gestalt IT supports. And if you have any recommendations for episode topics that we should cover for conversations, please make sure you hit me up on Twitter. I'm at Networking Nerd. I'm always looking for a great topic to have a conversation with you about. So until next time, thank you very much for tuning in, and we will see you next month.